And now for our final panel discussion of the day, looking at how media organisations are responding to the challenge of reporting communities in Britain. And chairing this panel, former head of BBC Southwest, now media consultant and lecturer in journalism at Plymouth Marjon University, Leo Devine. Leo, I'll hand over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we've mentioned the pandemic a lot this afternoon, haven't we? Many speakers have spoken about it and all the various lockdowns that we've been through. Um, many stories of people rediscovering what it means to be part of a community, perhaps because they've greeted neighbours for the first time, maybe, happened to me, sadly, um, perhaps because we're checking on that vulnerable person on the street who needs some shopping or whatever. But, you know, community is much more than a geographical position or a postcode. It can be all of those bonds of culture, ethnicity, sexuality, faith, all of those things can make up what it means to be part of a community. But for the media, reporting on that intricate mosaic of community can be a very challenging task because it's ever changing. It's always changing. So to discuss that challenge of reporting on communities, uh, we're joined by Stuart Thomas, who's head of BBC Midlands. We're also joined by Helen Harper, head of communities, regionals for Reach PLC. Alex Strangways Booth, BBC religion producer with a particular brief for BBC local and regional output. And also two frontline people, community reporters, Adnan Rashid, community reporter for Staffordshire Live, which is part of Reach PLC. And also uh, Debbie Luxon, community reporter for the Cambridge News. So welcome to all of you and thank you for joining us. We can't even fit you all on the screen, I don't think. Um, Debbie, um, let me come to you community reporter for Cambridge News. Let's start with you. What does it mean for you on that front line to be a community reporter? What is community? I think that's a question that I'm, I'm constantly trying to ask myself in this job. Um, the different community reporters have been given different patches across the UK to, to cover communities. Some people have very specific postcode patches, whereas I was given an entire county, including Peterborough, um, to cover and said, go and go and cover underrepresented groups. Um, so it's it's a, a very wide reaching term that I've been trying to think about in the in my two years in this role. For me, I, I chose to go at it at it from a um, an angle of, of who, who are the, who are the the least represented groups in the media. So in, in Cambridge, I, I identified almost immediately that there was a huge amount of a huge gap in um in balanced gypsy Roma and traveller representation within the news. Um, and and then it sort of expanded out from there. I do I do LGBT news. I do um, a lot of a lot of religion uh, and um, and race coverage as well. But I think also uh, when we're thinking about community, it's been hugely our idea of community has been hugely changed by the pandemic. And as you said, you you were finding um, the names of your neighbours for the first time throughout lockdown. And and I am now on speaking terms with lots of my neighbours and and their pets. And and through them, I've got. I've gotten different different stories. So, um, what is community and what is community news? I think it is is ultimately finding those stories that you just wouldn't find anywhere else, and, and that means living in that local area and really taking the time outside of your day job to to work with these groups. Adnan, I'm going to ask you the same question. What does community mean for you? Firstly, good afternoon to everyone. Um, similar to what Debbie uh, Debbie sorry said. Um, my idea of community was very different to what it is now from when I started. Initially, I just thought communities as race or religion, and that was it. But with the pandemic and also kind of identifying um, different aspects of my role, um, like I said earlier, so, you know, business owners who have similar businesses, they're a community. Pub landlords, for example, they're a community. Um, football teams or cricket clubs, similar to the club that I'm wearing. Sorry about that. Um, they're all communities. And it's given me, like I said, a different outlook to what the word community means. Um, it was felt my knowledge or idea of the word was quite restricted to begin with, but with the help of this role and um, understanding that you can have communities kind of within communities, um, it's yeah, it's expanded my my knowledge and my horizons to speak. 
Well, I'd like to explore that in a little bit more in a moment, but uh, let's go to Alex Strangway's booth, the BBC religion producer. You've got a kind of a wider brief insofar as you're covering the whole of BBC Local, BBC Local Radio in particular. How, how do you assess what is community and how does that affect how you report those communities? I think that, I think the term community is quite problematic actually, because it creates a sort of siloing there because like we're all part of different communities. Adnan, I think, had it right. You know, you're part, you might be part of a church group, you might be part of a parents group, you might be a school governor. You know, I think, I think it's a bit misleading. So I think when the way we, so I produce for all the 39 local radio stations for their Sunday faith programme. So we do have a specific programme that deals with, with faith and religion. But what we do is we look at the week's big issues through a lens of faith, because you can actually look at any issue um, you know, and see how it affects faith communities or what faith leaders might have to say about it or what different communities think about it. You know, we've had to do that the whole way through the pandemic with the vaccine. Um, so, you know, I think, uh, I think that when I, I think that when I first started doing this job, I was a community affairs reporter at BBC um, Sussex and BBC Surrey. And the way I got to know diverse communities was because I got to know their faith groups and I would go to church and I would go to mosques and I would go to meetings of faith groups and I got to know diverse communities as a result so I think you know I, I find communities can be problematic as a title and I find that there's often um, a disconnect between diversity and faith and people see diversity as one thing and faith and religion as another thing whereas the two are often very closely entwined. And I mean, everybody on this call has probably had a very busy weekend after the death of Prince Philip, but you had to, uh, what were you doing on Sunday? You had to completely change it. Yeah, so what we've, what we've started to do during the pandemic, which I've never done before because I'm a news journalist, is we started to do a half hour Sunday worship programme. So we do faith reflections. We call them reflections. They're not prayers. They are more reflections from the Muslim, Sikh, Hindu and Jewish communities on all the local radio shows every week but we also do a half hour of Sunday worship so yeah we had a we had a half hour worship program all made and done and dusted and then on Friday afternoon we had to make an entirely new one um I can see my colleague Roger Stamp on the call about whom I could not possibly survive the weekend because we also had to set up a whole load of new guests to talk about the Duke of Edinburgh so what happened with Sunday breakfast is that we looked at the death of the Duke of Edinburgh but the top line for every guest we spoke to and for our Sunday worship was um, was faith and religion so yeah I had to turn that was a I look a bit pale <laughs> I haven't seen myself today <laughs> but I feel pale we can have a rest in a minute um <laughs> It's, we, I want to talk about faith, obviously, because that's part of the reason this conference is here, but we're talking about communities in general. And Stuart, I mentioned we've got Stuart Thomas here, who's head of BBC Midlands, and also Helen Harper, head of communities regionals for Reach PLC. And Stuart, the last charter review for the BBC, which was 2017, the BBC committed, or was maybe strong-armed, into giving quite a bit of money to regional press in the form of you created a whole um a whole panoply of um local democracy reporters ldrs as we as we call them what was all that about and why did you see that as important in this contribution to reporting communities i think there was a fear leo that um uh, we were seeing a reduction in the ability of all local news organizations to hold uh, uh, people to account, particularly around, um, uh, you know, the kind of the smaller councils, if you like, um, and some of the smaller decision making bodies, uh, and that local newspapers didn't necessarily have that um, ability to send to council meetings that they used to, and actually local radio had stopped doing it, uh, the BBC didn't have the resources either. So as part of the, the license fee settlement last time around, we agreed to fund 150 uh, LDRs, uh, the Local Democracy Reporter Scheme. Uh, and that is a reporter who works for the, the local newspaper, but is funded by the BBC. And they create a feed of news stories about uh, democracy, uh, if you like. Um, uh, and I think that's quite a wide, uh, it can be quite a wide definition of, of what democracy is, but holding people to account in that area. Uh, and that feed is then shared, not just between 
the, the local newspaper, which is largely where the uh, LDR um, contracts were won, uh, and the BBC, but also any other news organisation who wants to subscribe. So there's about 900 organisations across uh, the UK who subscribe to these feeds from, you know, micro blogs that cover uh, one small part of a town to, um, uh, in some cases, ITV, uh, the BBC, obviously, uh, and the local, the local newspapers. So that's a feed of material constantly reporting on communities. And, and I think they've done an extraordinary job over the last three, four years of breaking stories that just would not have been heard uh, without this scheme existing. So it's making a difference. It's absolutely making a difference. And I, th I think it's, you know, I, I open my local paper here. I see the, the LDR's name uh, across the, the paper. Uh, when I'm allowed, I go and visit my mother-in-law in Huddersfield, I open the examiner, and it's full of stories uh, written by uh, the LDR, all of them, you know, around communities in, in that area, and all of them, uh, you know, I believe stories that wouldn't necessarily have come to light without this scheme. Okay, well, we'll talk more in a minute, and also, we should say, and I'm going to talk to Helen now, that that's not the kind of scheme that Adnan and, and Debbie are on, but we'll come on to that now with Helen. That you benefited at Reach PLC from the BBC's gift or uh, whatever you want to call it in terms of those local democracy reporters. But you've also got a very new and interesting scheme as well, which controversially, and we should discuss this, is funded entirely by, well, not entirely by, but by Facebook. So that's a, a new departure. You've got BBC money coming in from the charter. You've also got Facebook money coming in via the NCTJ, which is the training council uh, for a lot of journalists in this country. And Adnan and Debbie are both part of that scheme. How does, how does that work? So the Community News Project, which is funded by Facebook, was launched. It started in 2019. Uh, Facebook uh, awarded the project uh, £4.5 million. Pounds. Uh, and that was shared between a number of publishers, so Reach, JPI Media, NewsQuest, Archant and Midland News Association. It is administered by the National Council for the Training of Journalists. And it's all about um, increasing, well, representation and giving a voice to underrepresented communities. So like Debbie mentioned earlier, those communities might be geographical perhaps areas that um, titles felt they weren't, they weren't quite making a difference in, um, or it could be a certain demographic, like we mentioned before, so LGBT. Um, it could be young people specifically. Um, it, it was different, but it's not just about um, increasing the um, representation in our coverage. It's also about increasing diversity in our newsrooms too. So what's really, really interesting about this project is that there are three levels of reporter, so to speak. Um, the project is open to people with absolutely no experience of journalism whatsoever. People with some experience, so for example, they might have a, a media-based degree, um, and to people who already have their NCTJ diploma. Um, during their time on the project, they are then trained in their um, qualifications, um, and, and crucially, that their main role is to build up a relationship with these communities um, and to build trust. You know, they'll be speaking to people who have perhaps never been involved in the media before whatsoever. So it's, it's going out there and building that relationship. And it, it's not just writing a story and moving on, it's developing it, you know, keeping in touch with those contacts. So it, it's a really brilliant project. Okay, I mean, I, I can see the benefits of it. And again, I'm going to talk to Adam and, and Debbie in a second, but do you think there's an ethical dilemma? I mean, let's face it, you know, the regional press has been in difficulties in terms of its printed varieties. The BBC's faced a lot of cutbacks recently. You know, it's, it's, it's not always rosy out there, but taking money from the likes of Facebook, how, how do you think we justify that in 2021? Is it ethical? What about when you have to report on Facebook? So, I mean, that, that's, that's, you know, that's fine. This is, I think the thing is, um, Facebook started this project um, to sort of um, make sure that community journalists were getting to the, to the heart of communities. And um, in that time, in the first two years, um, like 68% of the reporters who have been hired as part of the scheme um, have met one or more of the diversity criteria being measured. And I appreciate what you're saying about Facebook and being accountable and what have you but you know that this has enabled 
80 journalists around the UK to be trained. People who, you know, traditionally it, it was the way to get into journalism. You had to have a degree. You had to have your recognised qualification. But actually, because that may be out of reach for some people, they never thought they'd be able to perhaps go to university, get a degree or get their NCTJ. And this is giving them that opportunity. So, you know, I, I think it's, it's been brilliant. And the, the thing is, you know, if there, that hasn't stopped reach um, or any of the other publishers uh, dealing with any issues that, do ar that might arise with okay. social media platforms. Okay, fair enough. Um, Debbie, let me come to you. What, what's your story then? I mean, you've already got your NCTJ diploma, haven't you, as far as I understand it. But um, just tell us your story then. Does, does it, has it helped, obviously, having this scheme funded by Facebook, whoever, the BBC? You know, tell us your story. Yeah, so I should say that I did, I, I got my NCTJ diploma from um, from the Facebook scheme. So I've, I literally just finished it back in January. Um, as exhausting as it was, it was a, a great, great experience. Um, yeah, so I mean, it definitely, I don't, I don't, I can't say whether I would be working as a reporter now without this um, opportunity. I actually came from a science background as my degree. So definitely, definitely not relevant for the um, the kind of community work um that that I do now but um my passion has always been working with um working to to increase representation with it within the press and, and creating a more responsible um journalism industry both in the UK and internationally so my previous work was actually working with the Guardian Foundation and groups like English Pen and um other groups similar to that in Turkey working to increase um the the press freedoms there that are currently if you have any understanding of the situation in turkey at the moment is being um and is continuing to be repressed so i was working on that in an international scale um and then having come back from um sort of one year of cavalier uh freelance freelance reporting in istanbul which maybe wasn't the the most sensible Thing to do without even a qualification I came back to the UK and I decided well I've, I've been working to organize these kind of academies and training programs for journalists un underrepresented and, and repressed journalists elsewhere um I, I want to, I wanted to have the have the experience of being part of these programs um themselves so that was my what I see as quite probably quite a unique way into this is this field is coming at it from a managerial standpoint and then wanting to to become um, a reporter and, and do it myself um i i am part of the lgbt community so i i have my own experience of, of perhaps not feeling represented maybe not in the news but in other um media um, and that has just driven my um my passion to do it um for every other community that i see in need of in need of that so it, to, sorry to to round that up. Um, yes, I, I definitely I, I'm not sure I would be working in journalism um, without without this. And I, I think the training and the support that Helen and the NCTJ and um, Facebook through their training boot camps um, has been has been incredibly important, both for me and for all of the other um, reporters, especially those who um, had no experience prior to prior to this um, yeah this this opportunity okay thank you i mean i'm going to ask you uh, in a few moments about some of the stories that you've been able to generate and where where that represents community and perhaps also since we are and here where we are today you know whether faith plays a part in that but adnan what's what's your story then in terms of being a community reporter and getting into this scheme um so yeah i graduated in broadcast journalism in god i think now 2017 um and then i did so I worked um, as a media coordinator for a charity. Um, I worked um, as a social media assistant for Eurostar, uh, but I wasn't really, I don't know, I didn't feel like I was putting my degree to good work or justice. Um, and then I actually saw, funnily enough, I saw an advert for a community reporter um, for Derbyshire Live, because I live in Derby. Um, I think someone sent it me or uh, someone sent me a link or something but I didn't I didn't really think too much of it um and then I thought oh well, I don't want to go through this I'll find a job you know maybe slightly cocky but um in the end I managed to apply for it and 
I got an interview. Um, but what what struck me was was the term again, community. Um, if it was a I don't know a sports reporter, I would have probably understood it's sports. But the term community didn't really. Um, I didn't really understand it. Again, like I mentioned earlier, um, I just thought it's probably going to be, oh, I'm Asian, bilingual, I might be working with the Asian community, for example. Um, but then when I had my job interview, um, they explained that it's not just one community, it's, you know, again, communities within communities. Um, so, yeah, when I when I got the job, I was you know, very happy, obviously. Um, it was a foot in the door. Um, and... Yeah, um, like similar to what Debbie said, really, the support, um, Helen, um, the NCTJ, Facebook Bootcamp, even our peers, um, we have our own group on Facebook where, again, it's a community. Um, you know, we share our stories, share best practice. Um, when I got the job, I got messages from literally everyone in the group saying, you know, well done, you're part of the team, all that stuff. Um, and it's nice. It's a nice, um, nice environment. Even now, even though we don't, um, we don't meet um, our cohorts because of obviously COVID restrictions. And um, we still, um, you know, when, when it when it was close to exam season, we were all um, in the same boat and we kind of whinge and whine and stuff. Um, but we managed to get through it. Um, and yeah, it's very right. well. Uh, I think we've been there all for about 18 months now. And yeah, it's going really well and hopefully long may it continue. All right, I'm going to ask you as well for some stories in just a moment, but going back to Alex, and as I say, you've got a much wider brief, I just want you to expand a bit on what you were talking about in terms of serving communities. And you do obviously have a very much of a, a faith, you know, that's your brief, that is what you do. Just, just tell us a bit more about how you are making a difference in terms of getting to those local communities. Well, look, I, th I think it's like this. I've worked in news gathering at the BBC as well. So I've, I've worked in both local radio and in network news. And there's a negative bias in network news towards religious stories. So network news is willing to do stories about religion if they're negative stories about religion. Uh, child abuse, illegal schools, you know, sex education. I don't know, pick your story. And that's all very well for national news. But for local reporters, and I'm sure that Debbie and Adnan might find this if people you know, think they're working for the BBC, it has repercussions for people who are working at a local level because those faith communities then do not trust you and it is very difficult to build a bond of trust with them. So Can what just, local... Yeah, go on. clarify what you're saying, Anna. Are you saying that in network news at the BBC... Well, and everywhere. It's not just the BBC, it's okay. the people as but well. There is, a, there is a bias to kind of presenting faith and religion in a very negative way. Is that yeah, because, like, you know what news is like. News needs headlines and it needs stories that people are going to read and be interested in and click on. I mean, you know, I'm not I'm not criticised the BBC. I've worked here for 25 years and I'm still here. <laughs> so I think, you know, I think the thing that local radio has over network news is that it's much, it's, it's able to get to know those communities and to build bonds of trust with those communities. And what we've done over the last decade as a central team is we tend to, we'll pick a really big story. So say, you know, the rise in uh, pauper's funerals, which anecdotally everybody knew about, but there was no data. We spent a long time gathering the data about whether or not there had been a rise. Then we were able to do a story about how there was a rise in pauper's funerals. Network News were able to do it. We looked at it through a faith lens because that's like a way to go into faith communities and find out a little bit more about those issues in faith communities. Uh, we did, we, we do like, we have done a lot of data stories. So our, our way of approaching these is to do a, a story where you can get a big strong headline and then the local stations can all own the story because they've, they've got a regional breakdown or they can get local voices on to talk about that story. So where the religious people are more charitable. So we've done a lot of comrades polls, you know. Um, so, so I think, you know, we we know that we as the media need strong stories. We can't just constantly do fluffy stories about how lovely the church tea was and how everybody's doing acts of selfless service at the Sikh temple. Like we can't do that every week. We have to find different stories to do. But but you know you have to sometimes you have to do stories that appear positive in order to build a bond of trust so that when you have to do the negative story, you've got a trust with that community and, and they will come on and they will talk to you. 
but I'm, I'm not asking you to necessarily criticize your own organization. You know, I'm sure you're very, very loyal. I know you are. But do you think there is a, <laughs> do you think there is a kind of a problem, not just with the BBC, but across the board, that generally sees religion as being something that's not important to people, faith is not important, and therefore it's almost disregarded or it becomes the songs of praise phenomenon. Oh, we've, we've done religion, we've done faith, we've, we've, we've had that. Do you, do you find that? You know, I would like to see our network news being much more um, creative and uh, brave about the stories that they do. Um, you know, but but we but we need the people on the ground. You know, and we've been cut to the bone as well in local radio. So, like, you know, you know, when I was a local reporter, I was doing the same thing as Adnan and, and Debbie, and getting out and getting out in the community and talking to people. But it's quite hard for local radio to do that now because we're quite, you know, we're 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 a much reduced service. Um, although I think we are rising to that challenge amazingly, amazingly well, um, especially through COVID. Um, so, you know, I have renewed faith in local broadcasting. And I think that projects like like this one, Helen and, and, and Debbie, and I, I think they're amazing projects. I think we need projects like that. But yeah, I do I do think there is a tendency to ghettoise religion. Into, I mean, we do it. We have it on Sunday mornings. You know, I'm, I'm part of the problem, <laughs> really. So, yes, I think we ghettoise it. Um, I think that people who work in the media tend to be more secular than the society at large. And Ofcom did do a survey of that a couple of years ago. I don't know if anyone else saw that survey that Ofcom did, but they found that um, people who worked at Channel 4 and the BBC tended to not have a face and it was disproportionate to society as a whole. So I do think that there's a little bit of a problem in that the actual people who work in the media themselves are probably tend to be a bit more secular. Thank you, Alex. Stuart, do you recognise that characterisation? And if so, even if some of it's true, what do you as part of the BBC leadership intend to do about it? I certainly think we in local and regional are much closer to um, the people uh, and the stories. And, and it will be that, you, you know, I, I can't think of the last time that Network News came to Derby, where, where Adnam is just, just over there, actually. Excited to hear he's so close, uh, a fellow East Midlander. Um, uh, but, you know, they come when uh, the factory is closing down that makes the trains. They don't come to do positive stories because, you know, it's a big country and there's lots of places to do and lots of stories to tell. So a lot of the time, the only time you will see a, a national journalist somewhere is when something bad's happened. And then we go in as the regional journalists or the local journalists and we want to tell the good stories. But perhaps we don't get trusted to tell the good stories because, we, you know, you're, you, you know, you're from a news organisation. And I'm not just talking about the BBC. Uh, you know, this is across it's across the board. I've worked in other news organisations. I know it's exactly the same. So we have to build a, a bond and a trust with communities. Uh, and I think, you know, schemes like the ones that, that Debbie and, and Adnan's on uh, uh, help do that. The, the local democracy reporter scheme do that. And actually just, you know, our local radio stations do that day in, day out. If you're a local, if you're a reporter for BBC Radio Derby, you know, it's your job to, to know uh, all the key players in Derby and, and to make sure that, that, that they trust you. But that, you know, then you go and see someone brand new and you've got to build that trust. I get that. Uh, what we're looking at doing is we launched um, uh, last year and the beginning part of this year, three pop up radio stations in Bradford, Wolverhampton and Sunderland, because we recognise the fact that although they're all actually areas served by a radio station, they're they're eclipsed by their neighbouring stations. So Bradford, for example, is served by BBC Radio from Leeds, but Leeds tends to dominate. So and Bradford's a very discreet and different community. So we launched a pop up station there. Same with Wolverhampton uh, and Birmingham. Same with with Sunderland. So. We, we launched those as temporary pop-up services to really try and get into those communities and better tell those stories. And actually, as part of what we've put forward to the government as our licence fee um, plans for the next period, we want to launch six of those permanently. Um, so we'd relaunch Bradford, which has actually come off air because it was only a temporary service, and Wolverhampton and Sunderland, and three more. So for us, getting into communities is, is really important. One of the other things we've talked about is launching 100 digital community reporters and those would be in towns and cities that have traditionally not been served by local radio or by regional TV. I mean, pretty much everywhere is officially served. But again, you know, if you're in Bradford, do you feel served by the BBC because it's all coming out of, of Leeds? And, and, you know, you don't feel like you're in Leeds. Helen, you are head of 
communities for each PLC or regionals head of community. What, what does that actually mean in practice? And, and do you recognize some of this tension between you've got national titles as part of regional, uh, part of reach PLC? Do you see that, do you recognize that tension yourself? And is sometimes your voice difficult to be heard in a big newspaper group like reach PLC? I think perhaps years ago, years ago, that was most certainly the case. But today, there's much more joined up working. So, for example, some of the community reporters have had their work published by the nationals. Um, it's very much a case of sort of sharing good content between them, uh, between our various titles around the UK and the nationals. Um, so years ago, yes. Um, not so much now. I, I do recognise what, what Alex was obviously saying about sort of, um, and Stuart, about going in there and then trying to sort of, you know, you can trust me, I'm local, that, that sort of, you know, behaviour. Um, and I, I think the thing is, you know, that, that will always exist to a certain extent with um, regional media, because they, they are there, they are based in the area, and they're the people that you see time and again, it, it, the people that will celebrate your your wonderful news, but also the challenging news, the sad news that, that, that comes out of these communities, they're always there. Um, so, yeah. Okay. Debbie, I asked you to think about some of the stories. Let's get to the nitty gritty. You know, as a community reporter, being out there, and I said before, Cambridge is kind of, I worked in Cambridge for the BBC once as well. You know, you've got the university, you've got that kind of higher end of the demography, but you've also got real pockets of poverty and um, social exclusion, all of those kind of issues. But what are the stories that you've done that you feel have really cut into the community and made a difference? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. I am... Um... Because of the the topic of this entire conference, I've I've gone for a religion um, theme within the picks. Um, can be other things. And, pardon. It could be other things, but let's let's go with the with the faith theme then. Yeah, well, so because I was thinking about this, and and though I do I do a lot of work with different religious communities within Cambridge, it, it is rarely a story about religion or about the religious community, because the fact is, uh, religious communities are, are a great way of accessing um, people who just wouldn't otherwise really talk to you and getting those kind of community based stories that though maybe aren't linked to a temple or a church, um, comes from that. Um, so and and. Again, with I, I really liked what everyone was saying about about the issue between balancing really wanting and needing to do positive stories, the fluffier stories is about the tea and cake at church. Like there is a place for that, and we we do need some positive, happy news, um, along with being able to be trusted with with the harder news, um, and and that is re that is really tricky as a community reporter. And I, I remember in my first sort of six months, my editor in chief saying to me, Debbie, we can't just be doing all of this positive news. We're not we're not a charity. We don't just hand that out. So it was really hard to kind of get that balance at first, um, and I, I think continues to be an issue. But um, I think just some of the the stories that I've been able to do. Um, there's an example of one of the first stories I did actually was on um, the um, an Ahmadiyya Muslim community in Cambridge, and I got um, I got this story through talking to um, Cambridge Central Mosque, who is a group um, which is obviously it's a mosque, um, and they're a very new, very quite quite a, um, a fancy establishment. And I, I talked to them I think for Islamophobia Awareness Month in November. And then they, um, I, I found about, out about this this other group who run a very um, simple simple mosque, actually in in a repurposed um, semi detached building um, a, a couple of roads away. And I and I said, oh, are, are these group linked to yours? Like, how does that work? And they almost kind of fobbed this group off. I, I'm not saying that that's sort of the main way Muslim communities deal with the different sects of Islam, but. That was just the singular um, example that that I'm sh showing you, and through that I, I learned about all about this history of this um, 80. Oh no, I think there are 120 strong um, Ahmadiyya Muslim community just on this one road in Cambridge, um, and I did a, a sort of a, a longer form historical piece about them, um, at, at talking to the different community members, the the women, the older men, um, as well as some of the younger. Um, Imams who who came to work to work in this in this mosque, um, 
And it was it was just a really interesting way of getting to know a community who have since I've had articles from them about their work through through COVID. Obviously, religious communities have been so, so needed and present within that community work of handing out food and, and making sure people are OK and, and can still talk to other people. Um, so through that, I've been able to, to work with this group almost the entire length of my contract. Um, and that was just a really lovely kind of breakthrough moment. Um, there are others, but I, I realise I've, no, no, I've probably gone on. Just in a, in a single response, you know, we were joking about it, what Helen was saying, what Stuart was saying, but do you have, find this, trust me, I'm local, is a really good in? I, I don't, I don't know. I got, a, excuse my French, but I got a good bollocking the first six months to year I was working um, <laughs> in Cambridge, just because most of the group, groups I wanted to work with did not want to talk to me. That's not just because of the brand I was working with. It, it, I think it's just, it's a journalism thing. And, and, the, the fact is they've been betrayed by other journalists before or they felt that they've been betrayed by other journalists and I think that's that's absolutely right and, and that was part of the reason why I went to my editor and I was like I want to do all these positive stories and they said well we can't do all of them but you know to kind of balance that and so it just it took a lot of talking um I'm I'm talking about the homeless community in Cambridge the um the Jewish community in Cambridge the gypsy roma traveler community you can imagine the kind of issues I was having with them trusting me um and quite rightly um so it, it's been it's been probably the hardest job of my life this job but um I definitely do it again Listen, Adnan, I'll come to you in a second, Adnan, but um, you just put a bit into the chat, Alex, and if anybody else wants to squeeze something into the chat that we can raise here with our guests. But Alex, you were saying that's exactly the point, what Debbie's saying, that, you know, religious pe people are just the same as everybody else. They care about the NHS. Well, you tell me what you're saying. Well, look, I, I've done community work for, for nearly 25 years. I've stayed in local radio. I didn't go into national news. I stayed in local radio because I honestly believe that our job is to give people who do not have a voice in other media a voice. That that is our reason for existing. But you know, in order to, to but in order to do that, they need to appear on all our other programs as well. Like we cannot silo them off into the God God slot, which is what the Bishop of Ripon said last week. It really irritated me because like I've been working for a decade for us not to be the God slot anymore. So I think you know. What, what you do is you get to know them you, you go in there you do that you do you get to know those communities and then when you know then you get the gp on to talk about vaccines in the breakfast program and it just so happens they're muslim they probably don't even mention they're muslim but their community know that they've been on the breakfast program on on bbc cambridge or whatever do you, do you see what i mean it's like it should be a long we should always be thinking long term with these community projects and i've seen a lot of community projects come and go in the last 25 years and I just really hope that these ones have longevity and that people don't, you know, people give them a decade to settle in and make a difference. Um, Adnan, you said that communities can be news agents, pub landlords, all sorts of things. But just give me, you know, I want to talk about the future as well and where we're going with Helen and Stuart. But I, I need to understand from you again as a community frontline reporter, where have you made a difference? What? Give me an example of a story you've done that's made a big difference. I think for me, the biggest, um, well, a story that I really enjoyed writing and helped get a lot of other stories was similarly to what Debbie said. It was about a mosque. Um, so I did a story uh, on the oldest mosque in Burton on Trent, which is the patch that I cover. Um, and from that, I found out they do um, soup kitchens. They do, um, uh, they have like a, a clothing, a clothes donor bank where people can drop off unwanted or unused um, or clothes they don't fit. Um, and the volunteers were all mixed, as in from different, mem you know, different uh, parts of the world and um, different race, different religion. And that helped me to understand the term community a lot more, like I said. Um, there were people there who were, you know, white British, um, members of the um, Afro-Caribbean community, Muslim community, Indian, Pakistani, you name it. Um, and off the back of, as I said, that one more story I've spoken to, their individual um, sort of, I've got individual stories from them. So a shopkeeper who's from Sri Lanka, he donated um, over £2,000 worth of stock to the food banks in Burson on Trent. Um, and that story, again, I probably would never have met him if I didn't go to the mosque. I would have probably walked past the off-licence 
a hundred times, but not known whose shop it was. Um, also, one thing that I, I like to do is I still keep in touch with, the, with my contacts and I don't just go to them when I need a story or a quote. Um, I live in Bertrand Trent and I think that's worked for me because when you're an outsider, people want to talk to you because locals might have different conceptions of how they are and stuff. Um, so when I first joined, um, there's four mosques in Burton on Trent and there's a bit of cohesion between them, but they were all pulling me into different directions. And I'd be like, look, I'm not part of any political, you know, agenda or anything. I'm just here with my notepad and pen. I'm going to get my quotes and then move on. Um, so for me, not being from the town has had um, a lot of advantages because I can kind of dive in and out. Um, like I said earlier, I don't have to worry about someone knocking on my door on Saturday. If I've misquoted them or anything, I can just turn my phone off. Um, so, it's, <laughs> so, yeah, from that point of view, I think um, the, for example, the Muslim community and the Burton Mail had a, a toxic relationship because... Um, long before I joined, a story was printed um, where one of the imams was misquoted and something along the lines of he wanted to build, build the biggest mosque in, in Britain, uh, which just wasn't possible. Burton on Trent is nowhere near as big enough as any you know, major um, cities. Um, so when I was tasked with you know, trying to um, build that relationship, I just went in you know, very simply and said, look, whatever's happened in the past, you know, I can't change that, but we can, you know, help yeah. um, enhance the reputation and move move on. And, you know, I'll, whenever you need me, I'll, I'll, I'll be down. And sometimes I'd go to um, a few of the events that they had, you know, after work, just to kind of make them realise that I'm not just there, you know, just for, for the story. And, you know, even now, um, occasionally I'll get a text from the imam just asking how I am, how my family's doing. So I wouldn't call them friends, um, but the people that I... Don't just talk to for work purposes. I think every journalist knows that having a network, as somebody said earlier, or, or a good contacts book, you know, that doesn't go away. That's really important to know people and to understand them and to have a relationship with them. Listen, I've only got um, four minutes left, I think, now. I want to kind of focus also on the future. I mean, you've got these journalists, Helen, now who are working on, your, on the front line, and you've got this very successful um, live pages um, proliferation around the country, you know, like Cornwall Live, where I live, etc. They're very, very hyper local. Once the, is the Facebook money going to dry up? You know, what's going to happen? What's your future plan? And then I want to ask the same question for Stuart as well. So Facebook announced that they've extended the project for another year. Um, and then after that, we'll have to see. However, what I do want to emphasize is that um, all the newsrooms, I think, benefit from having a community reporter there. And taking on board their learnings and, and how they can change. And something that's really important at the moment to the company is um, diversity and inclusion. Um, so this is something that is um, a plan to being drawn up um, for the coming years about the way forward, it, both again in our newsroom and in our coverage. So I think the Community News Project is just an absolute step in the right direction. And hopefully going forward, um, the, the reporters will continue to make a difference in the work that they do. Well, good luck with that and um, wish you all very a uh, lot of success. But Stuart, just in the final two minutes, you're presiding over the BBC's move to Birmingham. I mean, we've seen lots of moves in the past. I mean, religion was once moved to Manchester many years ago, wasn't it? And then we've had more recently the Salford move. What does it mean for localness, shifting everything out of London to the places like Birmingham? I think it's really important, Leo. I, think it's, and I also think it's really exciting. I, I think on two fronts, for a start, if you are a journalist or an aspiring journalist in Birmingham, the idea that you could have a whole career there now where you move through different bits of the BBC, but you don't have to leave the Midlands is really exciting. So, you know, you could start in local radio and move to the Asian network. You can move to Newsbeat, all of which are moving lock, stock and barrel to, um, to Birmingham. I think that's really exciting. But secondly, I think just for portrayal, I think every journalist on every national um, broadcaster and newspaper uh, knows that actually we didn't get the tone of the country right around Brexit and we we didn't quite understand you know it was a surprise to a lot of national journalists uh, not not necessarily those of us working locally a surprise the outcome to national journalists so we've got to be better 
at, at you know having our tentacles all those networks out in different places and if you put the whole of newsbeat into birmingham which is going to happen next year then that's a whole national news program that will be based in a city that is not london and i think that's the most important thing about being in places that are not london um and you know birmingham's a young diverse exciting place to be and i think newsbeat being there the whole of the asian network being there uh, some various other bits of news going to be there and also spreading out across the uk other things happening in other bits of uh, of the UK I think that is a really exciting moment uh, and yes the BBC made big strides when we moved to Salford but that was one one big move to one big city I think spreading it out now across the whole of the UK is is going to be important to get better stories out of more communities. Stuart thank you so thank you to all of you Stuart, Helen, Alex, Adnan and Debbie. I just want to end with a very very quick quote because it's from a hero of mine Frank Gillard who started BBC local radio in 1967. And that was the first kind of foray really, I think, for the BBC. But what he said still rings true now. He said, what I want to do and what is so important is to present the running serial story of local life in all of its many forms and through a multitude of local voices. That is the essence of community. I think that still rings true today. Thank you to you all, I'll hand back now.